Chapter Eleven of the Crucifixion of Philip Strong by Charles Monroe Sheldon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Gore. Chapter Eleven. I heard your sermon this morning," said Philip's guest, while Mrs. Strong was removing the small table to the dining room. Did you? asked Philip because he could not think of anything wiser to say. "'Yes,' said the strange visitor, simply. He was so silent after saying this one word that Philip did what he never was in the habit of doing. He always shrank back sensitively from asking for an opinion of his preaching from any one except his wife. But now he could not help saying, "'What did you think of it?' it was one of the best sermons i ever heard but somehow it did not sound sincere what exclaimed philip almost angrily if there was one thing he felt sure about it was the sincerity of his preaching then he checked his feeling as he thought how foolish it would be to get angry at a passing tramp who was probably a little out of his mind yet the man's remark had a strange power over him he tried to shake it off as he looked harder at him the man looked over at philip and repeated gravely shaking his head not sincere mrs strong came back into the room and philip motioned her to sit down near him while he said and what makes you think i was not sincere you said the age in which we lived demanded that people live in a far simpler less extravagant style yes that is what i said i believe it too replied philip clasping his hands over his knee and gazing at his singular guest with earnestness the man's thick white hair glistened in the open firelight like spun glass and you said that christ would not approve of people spending money for flowers food and dress on those who did not need it when it could more wisely be expended for the benefit of those who were in want yes those were not my exact words but that was my idea your idea just so and yet we have here in this little lunch, or as you called it, a bite of something, three different kinds of meat, two kinds of bread, hothouse grapes, and the richest kind of milk. The man said all this in the quietest, calmest manner possible, and Philip stared at him, more assured than ever that he was a little crazy. Mrs. Strong looked amused, and said, you seemed to enjoy the lunch pretty well the man had eaten it with a zest that was redeemed from greediness only by a delicacy of manner that no tramp ever possessed my dear madam said the man perhaps this was a case where the food was given to one who stood really in need of it Philip started as if he had suddenly caught a meaning from the man's words which he had not before heard in them. "'Do you think it was an extravagant lunch, then?' he asked, with a very slight laugh. The man looked straight at Philip and replied slowly, "'Yes, for the times in which we live.' A sudden silence fell on the group of three in the parlor of the parsonage, lighted up by the soft glow of the coal fire. No one except a person thoroughly familiar with the real character of Philip Strong could have told why that silence fell on him instead of a careless laugh at the crazy remark of a half-witted stranger tramp. Just how long the silence lasted he did not know. Only, when it was broken, he found himself saying, "'Man, who are you? Where are you from? And what is your name?' His guest turned his head a little and replied, "'When you called me in here, you stretched out your hand and called me brother. Just now you called me by the great term man. These are my names.' 
you may call me brother man well then brother man said philip smiling a little to think of the very strangeness of the whole affair your reason for thinking i was not sincere in my sermon this morning was because of the extravagant lunch this evening not altogether there are other reasons the man suddenly bowed his head between his hands and philip's wife whispered to him philip what is the use of talking with the crazy man you are tired and it is time to put out the lights and go to bed get him out of the house now as soon as you can the stranger raised his head and went on talking just as if he had not broken off abruptly other reasons in your sermon you tell the people they ought to live less luxuriously you point them to the situation in this town where thousands of men are out of work you call attention to the great poverty and distress all over the world and you say the times demand that people live far simpler less extravagant lives and yet here you live yourself like a prince like a prince he repeated after a peculiar gesture which seemed to include not only what was in the room but all that was in the house philip glanced at his wife as people do when they suspect a third person being out of his mind and saw that her expression was very much like his own feeling although not exactly then they both glanced around the room it certainly did look luxurious even if not princely the parsonage was an old mansion which had once belonged to a wealthy but eccentric sea captain he had it built to please himself something after the colonial fashion and large square rooms generous fireplaces with quaint mantels and tiling and hardwood floors gave the house an appearance of solid comfort that approached luxury the church in milton had purchased the property from the heirs who had become involved in ruinous speculation and parted with the house for a sum little representing its real worth it had been changed a little and modernized although the old fireplaces still remained and one spare room an annex to the house proper had been added recently there was an air of decided comfort bordering on luxury in the different pieces of furniture and the whole appearance of the room you understand said philip as his glance travelled back to his visitor that this house is not mine it belongs to my church it is the parsonage and i am simply living in it as the minister yes i understand you a minister are living in this princely house while other people have not where to lay their heads again philip felt the same temptation to anger steal into him and again he checked himself at the thought the man is certainly insane the whole thing is simply absurd i will get rid of him and yet he could not shake off a strange and powerful impression which the stranger's words had made upon him crazy or not the man had hinted at the possibility of an insincerity on his part which made him restless he determined to question him and see if he really would develop a streak of insanity that would justify him in getting rid of him for the night brother man he said using the term his guest had given him do you think i am living too extravagantly to live as i do yes in these times and after such a sermon what would you have me do philip asked the question half seriously half amused at himself for asking advice from such a source do as you preach that others ought to again that silence fell over the room and again philip felt the same impression of power in the strange man's words the brother man as he wished to be called bowed his head between his hands again and mrs strong whispered to her husband 
Now it is certainly worse than foolish to keep this up any longer. The man is evidently insane. We cannot keep him here all night. He will certainly do something terrible. Get rid of him, Philip. This may be a trick on the part of the whiskey men. Never in all his life had Philip been so puzzled to know what to do with a human being. Here was one, the strangest he had ever met, who had come into his house. It is true that he had been invited, but once within he had invited himself to stay all night, and then had accused his entertainer of living too extravagantly and called him an insincere preacher. Add to all this the singular fact that he had declared his name to be Brother Man, and that he spoke with a calmness that was the very incarnation of peace, and Philip's wonder reached its limit. In response to his wife's appeal, Philip rose abruptly and went to the front door. He opened it, and a whirl of snow danced in. The wind had changed, and the moan of a coming heavy storm was in the air. The moment that he opened the door, his strange guest also rose, and putting on his hat, he said, as he moved slowly toward the hall, "'I must be going.' I thank you for your hospitality, madam. Philip stood holding the door partly open. He was perplexed to know just what to do or say. Where will you stay tonight? Where is your home? My home is with my friends, replied the man. He laid his hand on the door, opened it, and had stepped one foot out on the porch when Philip, seized with an impulse, laid his hand on his arm, gently but strongly pulled him back into the hall, shut the door, and placed his back against it. "'You cannot go out into this storm until I know whether you have a place to go to for the night.' The man hesitated curiously, shuffled his feet on the mat, put his hand up to his face, and passed it across his eyes with a gesture of great weariness. There was a look of loneliness and of unknown sorrow about his whole figure that touched Philip's keenly sensitive spirit irresistibly. If the man was a little out of his right mind, he was probably harmless. They could not turn him out into the night if he had nowhere to go. "'Brother man,' said Philip, gently, "'would you like to stay here tonight? Have you anywhere else to stay?' You are afraid I will do harm, but no. See, let us sit down. He laid his hat on the table, resumed his seat, and asked Philip for a Bible. Philip handed him one. He opened it and read a chapter from the prophet Isaiah, and then, sitting in the chair, bowing his head between his hands, he offered a prayer of such wonderful beauty and spiritual refinement of expression that Mr. and Mrs. Strong listened with awed astonishment. When he had uttered the Amen, Mrs. Strong whispered to Philip, Surely we cannot shut him out with the storm. We will give him the spare room. Philip said not a word. He at once built up a fire in the room, and in a few moments invited the man into it. "'Brother man,' he said simply, "'stay here as if this was your own house. You are welcome for the night.' "'Yes, heartily welcome,' said Philip's wife, as if to make amends for any doubt she had felt before. For reply, the brother man raised his hand almost as if in benediction." and they left him to his rest. End of chapter 11 Recording by David Gore Chapter 12 of The Crucifixion of Philip Strong by Charles Monroe Sheldon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Gore Chapter 12 in the morning, Philip knocked at his guest's door to waken him for breakfast. Not a sound could be heard within. He waited a little while and then knocked again. 
It was as still as before. He opened the door softly and looked in. To his amazement there was no one there. The bed was made up neatly, everything in the room was in its place, but the strange being who had called himself Brother Man was gone. Philip exclaimed, and his wife came in. So our queer guest has flown. He must have been very still about it. I heard no noise. Where do you suppose he is, and who do you suppose he is? Are you sure there was ever such a person, Philip? Don't you think you dreamed all that about the brother man? Mrs. Strong had not quite forgiven Philip for his skeptical questioning of the reality of the man with the lantern who had driven the knife into the desk. Yes, it's your turn now, Sarah. Well, if our brother man was a dream, he was the most curious dream this family ever had, and if he was crazy, he was the most remarkable insane person I ever saw. Of course he was crazy. All that he said about our living so extravagantly. Do you think he was crazy in that particular? asked Philip in a strange voice. His wife noticed it at the time, but its true significance did not become real to her until afterward. He went to the front door and found it was unlocked. Evidently, the guest had gone out that way. The heavy storm of the night had covered up any possible signs of footsteps. It was still snowing furiously. He went into his study for the forenoon as usual, but he did very little writing. His wife could hear him pacing the floor restlessly. About ten o'clock he came downstairs and declared his intention of going out into the storm to see if he couldn't settle down to work better. He went out and did not return until the middle of the afternoon. Mrs. Strong was a little alarmed. "'Where have you been all this time, Philip? In this terrible storm, too. You are a monument of snow. Stand out here in the kitchen while I sweep you off.' Philip obediently stood still while his wife walked around him with a broom and good-naturedly submitted to being swept down, as if I were being worked into shape for a snowman, he said. Where have you been? Give an account of yourself. I have been seeing how some other people live. Sarah, the brother man, was not so very crazy after all. He has more than half converted me. Did you find out anything about him? Yes, several of the older citizens here recognized my description of him. They say he is harmless and has quite a history, was once a wealthy mill owner in Clinton. He wanders about the country, living with anyone who will take him in. It is a queer case. I must find out more about him. But I'm hungry. Can I have a bite of something? Haven't you had dinner? No, haven't had time. Where have you been? Among the tenements. How are the people getting on there? I cannot tell. It almost chokes me to eat when I think of it. Now, Philip, what makes you take it so seriously? How can you help all that suffering? You are not to blame for it. Maybe I am for a part of it. But whether I am or not, there the suffering is. And I don't know as we ought to ask who is to blame in such cases. At any rate, supposing the fathers and the mothers in the tenements are to blame themselves by their own sinfulness, does that make innocent children and helpless babes any warmer or better clothed and fed? Sarah, I have seen things in these four hours' time that make me want to join the bomb-throwers of Europe, almost. Mrs. Strong came up behind his chair as he sat at the table eating and placed her hand on his brow. She grew more anxious every day over his growing personal feeling for others. It seemed to her it was becoming a passion with him, wearing him out, and she feared its results as winter deepened 
and the strike in the mills remained unbroken. "'You cannot do more than one man, Philip,' she said with a sigh. "'No, but if I can only make the church see its duty at this time and act the Christ-like way, a great many persons will be saved.' He dropped his knife and fork, wheeled around abruptly in his chair, and faced her with the question, "'Would you give up this home and be content to live in a simpler fashion than we have been used to since we came here?' "'Yes,' replied his wife, quietly. "'I will go anywhere and suffer anything with you. What is it you are thinking of now?' "'I need a little more time.' There is a crisis near at hand in my thought of what Christ would require of me. My dear, I am sure we shall be led by the Spirit of truth to do what is necessary and for the better saving of men. He kissed his wife tenderly and went upstairs again to his work. All through the rest of the afternoon and in the evening, as he shaped his church and pulpit work, the words of the brother man rang in his ears, and the situation at the tenements rose in the successive panoramas before his eyes. As the storm increased in fury with the coming darkness, he felt that it was typical in a certain sense of his own condition. He abandoned the work he had been doing at his desk, and kneeling down at his couch, he prayed. Mrs. Strong, coming up to the study to see how his work was getting on, found him kneeling there and went and kneeled beside him, while together they sought the light through the storm. So the weeks went by, and the first Sunday of the next month found Philip's Christ message even more direct and personal than any he had brought to his people before. He had spent much of the time going into the working men's houses. The tenement district was becoming familiar territory to him now. He had settled finally what his own action ought to be. In that action his wife fully concurred, and the members of Calvary Church, coming in that Sunday morning, were astonished at the message of their pastor as he spoke to them from the standpoint of modern Christ. I said a month ago that the age in which we live demands a simpler, less extravagant style of living. I did not mean by that to condemn the beauties of art, or the marvels of science, or the products of civilization. I merely emphasized what I believe is a mighty but neglected truth in our modern civilization, that if we would win men to Christ, we must adopt more of his spirit of simple and consecrated self-denial. I wish it to be distinctly understood as I go on that I do not condemn any man simply because he is rich or lives in a luxurious house enjoying every comfort of modern civilization, every delicacy of the season, and all physical desires. What I do wish distinctly understood is the belief which has been burned deep into me ever since coming to this town, that if the members of this church wish to honor the head of the church and bring men to believe him and save them in this life and the next, they must be willing to do far more than they have yet done to make use of the physical comforts and luxuries of their homes for the blessing and Christianizing of this community. In this particular, I have myself failed to set you an example. The fact that I have so failed is my only reason for making this matter public this morning. The situation in Milton today is exceedingly serious. I do not need to prove it to you by figures. If any business man will go through the tenements, he will acknowledge my statements. If any woman will contrast those dens with her own home, she will, if Christ is a power in her heart, stand in horror before such a travesty on the sacred thought of honor. The destitution of the neighborhood is alarming. 
the number of men out of work is dangerous the complete removal of all sympathy between the church up here on this street and the tenement district is sadder than death oh my beloved philip stretched out his arms and uttered a cry that rang in the ears of those who heard it and remained with some of them a memory for years these things ought not so to be where is the christ spirit with us have we not sat in our comfortable houses and eaten our pleasant food and dressed in the finest clothing and gone to amusements and entertainments without number while god's poor have shivered on the streets and his sinful ones have sneered at christianity as they have walked by our church doors it is true we have given money to charitable causes it is true the town council has organized a bureau for the care and maintenance of those in want it is true members of calvary church with other churches at this time have done something to relieve the immediate distress of the town but how much have we given of ourselves to those in need do we reflect that to reach souls and win them to bring back humanity to god and the christ the christian must do something different from the giving of money now and then he must give a part of himself that was my reason for urging you to move this church building away from this street into the tenement district that we might give ourselves to the people there the idea is the same in what i now propose but you will pardon me if first of all i announce my own action which i believe is demanded by the times and would be approved by our lord philip stepped up near the front of the platform and spoke with an added earnestness and power which thrilled every hearer a part of the great conflict through which he had gone that past month shone out in his pale face and found partial utterance in his impassioned speech especially as he drew near the end the very abruptness of his proposition smote the people into breathless attention the parsonage in which i am living is a large even luxurious dwelling it has nine large rooms you are familiar with its furnishings the salary this church pays me is two thousand dollars a year a sum which more than provides for my necessary wants what i have decided to do is this I wish this church to reduce this salary one half and take the other thousand dollars to the fitting up the parsonage for a refuge for homeless children or for some such purpose which will commend itself to your best judgment. There is money enough in this church alone to maintain such an institution handsomely and not a single member of Calvary suffer any hardship whatever i will move into a house nearer the lower part of the town where i can more easily reach after the people and live more among them that is what i propose for myself it is not because i believe the rich and the educated do not need the gospel or the church the rich and the poor both need the life more abundantly but i am firmly convinced that as matters now are the church membership through pulpit and pew must give itself more than in the later ages of the world it has done for the sake of winning men the form of self-denial must take a definite physical genuinely sacrificing shape the church must get back to the apostolic times in some particulars and an adaptation of community of goods and a sharing of certain aspects of civilization must mark the church membership of the coming twentieth century an object lesson in self-denial large enough for men to see a self-denial that actually gives up luxuries money and even pleasures this is the only kind that will make much impression on the people 
I believe if Christ was on earth he would again call for this expression of loyalty to him. He would again say, So likewise whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. All this is what I call on the members of this church to do. Do I say that you ought to abandon your own houses and live somewhere else? No. I can decide only for myself in a matter of that kind. But this much I do. Give yourselves in some genuine way to save this town from its evil wretchedness. It is not so much your money as your own soul that the sickness of the world needs. This plan has occurred to me. Why could not every family in this church become a savior to some other family, interest itself in the other, know the extent of its wants as far as possible, go to it in person, let the Christian home come into actual touch with the unchristian, in short, become a natural savior to one family? There are dozens of families in this church that could do that. It would take money. It would take time. It would mean real self-denial. It would call for all your Christian grace and courage. But what does all this church membership and church life mean if not just such sacrifice? We cannot give anything to this age of more value than our own selves. The world of sin and want and despair and disbelief is not hungering for money or mission schools or charity balls or state institution for the relief of distress, but for live, pulsing, loving Christian men and women who reach out live, warm hands, who are willing to go and give themselves, who will abandon, if necessary, if Christ calls for it, the luxuries they have these many years enjoyed in order that the bewildered, disheartened, discontented, unhappy, sinful creatures of earth may actually learn of the love of God through the love of man." and that is the only way the world ever has learned of the love of God. Humanity brought that love to the heart of the race, and it will continue to do so until this earth's tragedy is all played and the last light put out. Members of Calvary Church, I call on you in Christ's name this day to do something for your master that will really show the world that you are what you say you are when you claim to be a disciple of that one who, although he was rich, yet for our sakes became poor, giving up all heaven's glory in exchange for all earth's misery, the end of which was a cruel and bloody crucifixion. Are we Christ's disciples unless we are willing to follow him in this particular? We are not our own. We are bought with a price. When that Sunday service closed, Calvary Church was stirred to its depths. There were more excited people talking together all over the church than Philip had ever seen before. He greeted several strangers as usual, and was talking with one of them when one of the trustees came up and said the board would like to meet him, if convenient for him, as soon as he was at liberty. Philip accordingly waited in one of the Sunday school classrooms with the trustees, who had met immediately after the sermon, and decided to have an instant conference with the pastor. End of chapter 12 Recording by David Gore Chapter 13 of The Crucifixion of Philip Strong by Charles Monroe Sheldon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Gore Chapter 13 The door of the classroom was closed, and Philip and the trustees were together. There was a moment of embarrassing silence, 
then the spokesman for the board a nervous little man said mr strong we hardly know just what to say to this proposition of yours this morning about going out of the parsonage and turning it into an orphan asylum but it is certainly a very remarkable proposition and we felt as if we ought to meet you at once and talk it over it's simply impossible spoke up one of the trustees in the first place it is impracticable as a business proposition do you think so asked philip quietly it is out of the question said the first speaker excitedly the church will never listen to it in the world for my part if brother strong wishes to at that moment the sexton knocked at the door and said a man was outside very anxious to see the minister and have him come down to his house there had been an accident or a fight or something someone was dying and wanted mr strong at once so philip hastily excused himself and went out leaving the trustees together the door was hardly shut again when the speaker who had been interrupted jumped to his feet and exclaimed as i was saying for my part if brother strong wishes to indulge in this eccentric action he will not have the sanction of my vote in the matter it certainly is an entirely unheard of and uncalled for proposition mr strong has no doubt a generous motive in this proposed action said a third member of the board but the church certainly will not approve of any such step as the giving up of the parsonage he exaggerates the need of such a sacrifice i think we ought to reason him out of the idea we called for mr strong to the pastorate of calvary church said another and it seems to me he came under the conditions granted in our call for the church to allow such an absurd thing as the giving up of the parsonage to this proposed outside work would be a very unwise move yes and more than that said the first speaker i want to say very frankly that i am growing tired of the way things have gone since mr strong came to us what business has calvary church with all these outside matters these labor troubles and unemployed men and all the other matters that have been made the subject of preaching lately i want a minister who looks after his own parish mr strong does not call on his own people he has not been inside my house but once since he came to milton brethren there is a growing feeling of discontent over this matter there was a short pause then one of the members said surely if mr strong feels dissatisfied with his surroundings in the parsonage or feels as if his work lay in another direction he is at liberty to choose another parish but he is the finest pulpit minister we ever had and no one doubts his entire sincerity he is a remarkable man in many respects yes but sincerity may be a very awkward thing if carried too far and in this matter of the parsonage i don't see how the trustees can allow it why what would the other churches think of it calvary church cannot allow anything of the kind for the sake of its reputation but i would like to hear mr winter's opinion he has not spoken yet the rest turned to the mill owner who as chairman of the board usually had much to say and was regarded as a shrewd and careful business adviser in the excitement of the occasion and discussion the usual formalities of a regular board meeting had been ignored mr winter was evidently embarrassed he had listened to the discussion of the minister with his head bent down and his thoughts in a whirl of emotion both for and against the pastor his naturally inclined business habits contended against the proposition to give up the parsonage his feelings of gratitude to the minister for his personal help the night of the attack by the mob rose up to defend him 
there was with it all an undercurrent of self-administered rebuke that the pastor had set the whole church an example of usefulness he wondered how many of the members would voluntarily give up half their incomes for the good of humanity he wondered in a confused way how much he would give up himself philip's sermon had made a real impression on him there is one point we have not discussed yet he said at last and that is mr strong's offer of half his salary to carry on the work of a children's refuge or something of that kind how can we accept such an offer calvary church has always believed in paying its minister a good salary and paying it promptly and we want our minister to live decently and be able to appear as he should among the best people replied the nervous little man who had been first to speak still we cannot deny that it is a very generous thing for mr strong to do he is certainly entitled to credit for his unselfish proposal no one can charge him with being worldly minded said mr winter feeling a new interest in the subject as he found himself defending the minister are you in favor of allowing him to do what he proposes in the matter of the parsonage asked another i don't see that we can hinder mr strong from living anywhere he pleases if he wants to the church cannot compel him to live in the parsonage no but it can choose not to have such a minister exclaimed the first speaker again excitedly and i for one am most decidedly opposed to the whole thing i do not see how the church can allow it and maintain its self-respect do you think the church is ready to tell mr strong that his services are not wanted any longer asked mr winter coldly i am for one of the members and i know others who feel as i do if matters go on in this way much longer i tell you brother winter calvary church is very near a crisis look at the goldens and the malverns and the albergs they are all leaving us and the plain reason is the nature of the preaching why you know yourself brother winter that never has the pulpit of calvary church heard such preaching on people's private affairs mr winter colored and replied angrily what has that to do with this present matter if the minister wants to live in a simpler style i don't see what business we have to try to stop it as to the disposition of the parsonage that is a matter of business which rests with the church to arrange the nervous irritable little man who had spoken oftenest rose to his feet and exclaimed you can count me out of all this then i wash my hands of the whole affair and he went out of the room leaving the rest of the board somewhat surprised at his sudden departure they remained a quarter of an hour longer discussing the matter and finally at mr winter's suggestion a committee was appointed to go and see the minister the next evening and see if he could not be persuaded to modify or change his proposition made in the morning sermon the rest of the trustees insisted that mr winter himself should act as chairman of the committee and after some remonstrance he finally with great reluctance agreed to do so so philip next evening as he sat in his study mapping out the week's work and wondering a little what the church would do in the face of his proposal received the committee welcoming them in his bright hearty manner he had been notified on sunday evening of the approaching conference the committee consisted of mr winter and two other members of the board mr winter opened the conversation with considerable embarrassment and an evident reluctance for his share in the matter mr strong we have come as you are aware to talk over your proposition of yesterday morning concerning the parsonage it was a great surprise to us all philip smiled a little 
Mrs. Strong says I act too much on impulse, and I do not prepare people enough for my statements. But one of the greatest men I ever knew used to say that an impulse was a good thing to obey instantly if there was no doubt of its being a right one. And do you consider this proposed move of yours a right one, Mr. Strong? asked Mr. Winter. I do, replied Philip, with quiet emphasis. I do not regret making it, and I believe it is my duty to abide by my original decision. Do you mean that you intend actually to move out of this parsonage? asked one of the other members of the committee. Yes. Philip said it so quietly and yet so decidedly that the men were silent a moment. Then Mr. Winter said, Mr. Strong, this matter is likely to cause trouble in the church, and we might as well understand it frankly. The trustees believe that, as the parsonage belongs to the church property and was built for the minister, he ought to live in it. The church will not understand your desire to move out. Do you understand it, Mr. Winter? Philip put the question point blank. No, I don't know that I do, wholly, Mr. Winter colored and replied in a hesitating manner. I gave my reasons yesterday morning. I do not know that I can make them plainer. The truth is, I cannot go on preaching to my people about living on a simpler basis while I continue to live in surroundings that on the face of them contradict my own convictions. In other words, I am living beyond my necessities here. I have lived all my life surrounded by the luxuries of civilization. If now I desire to give these benefits to those who have never enjoyed them, or to know from nearer contact something of the bitter struggle of the poor, why should I be hindered from putting that desire into practical form? The question is, Mr. Strong, said one of the other trustees, whether this is the best way to get at it. We do not question your sincerity nor doubt your honesty. But will your leaving the parsonage and living in a less expensive house on half your present salary help your church work or reach more people and save more souls? I'm glad you put it that way, exclaimed Philip, eagerly turning to the speaker. That is just it. Will my proposed move result in bringing the church and the minister into closer and more vital relations with the people most in need of spiritual and physical uplifting? Out of the depths of my nature, I believe it will. The chasm between the church and the people in these days must be bridged by the spirit of sacrifice in material things. It is in vain for us to preach spiritual truths unless we live physical truths. What the world is looking for today is object lessons in self-denial on the part of Christian people. For a moment no one spoke. Then Mr. Winter said, About your proposal that this house be turned into a refuge or a home for homeless children, Mr. Strong, do you consider that idea practicable? Is it business? Is it possible? I believe it is, very decidedly. The number of homeless and vagrant children at present in Milton would astonish you. This house could be put into beautiful shape as a detention house until homes could be found for the children in Christian families. It would take a great deal of money to manage it. Yes, replied Philip, with a sadness which had its cause deep within him. It would cost something. But can the world be saved cheaply? Does not every soul saved cost an immense sum, if not of money, at least of an equivalent? Is it possible for us to get at the heart of the great social problem without feeling the need of using all our powers to solve it rightly? Mr. Winter shook his head. He did not understand the minister. 
His action and his words were both foreign to the mill owner's regular business habits of thought and performance. "'What will you do, Mr. Strong, if the church refuses to listen to this proposed plan of yours?' "'I suppose,' answered Philip, after a little pause, "'the church will not object to my living in another house at my own charges?' "'They have no right to compel you to live here.' Mr. Winter turned to the other members of the committee. I said so at our previous meeting. Gentlemen, am I not right in that? It is not a question of our compelling Mr. Strong to live here, said one of the others. It is a question of the churches expecting him to do so. It is the parsonage and the church home for the minister. In my opinion, it will cause trouble if Mr. Strong moves out. People will not understand it. That is my belief, too, Mr. Strong, said Mr. Winter. It would be better for you to modify or change, or better still, to abandon this plan. It will not be understood and will cause trouble. Suppose the church should rent the parsonage, then, suggested Philip. It would then be getting a revenue from the property. That, with a thousand dollars on my salary, could be wisely and generously used to relieve much suffering in Milton this winter. The church could easily rent the house. That was true, as the parsonage stood on one of the most desirable parts of B Street and would command good rental. Then you persist in this plan of yours, do you, Mr. Strong? asked the third member of the committee, who had for the most part been silent. Yes, I consider that under the circumstances, local and universal, it is my duty. Where I propose to go is a house which I can get for eight dollars a month. It is near the tenement district, and not so far from the church and this neighborhood that I need be isolated too much from my church family. Mr. Winter looked serious and perplexed. The other trustees looked dissatisfied. It was evident they regarded the whole thing with disfavor. Mr. Winter rose abruptly. He could not avoid a feeling of anger in spite of his obligation to the minister. He also had a vivid recollection of his former interview with the pastor in that study and yet he struggled with the vague resistance against the feeling that Philip was proposing to do a thing that could result in only one way, of suffering for himself. With all the rest went a suppressed but conscious emotion of wonder that a man would, of his own free will, give up a luxurious home for the sake of any one. The matter of the reduction of salary, Mr. Strong, will have to come before the church. The trustees cannot vote to accept your proposal. I am very much mistaken if the members of Calvary Church will not oppose the reduction. You can see how it would place us in an unfavorable light. Not necessarily, Mr. Winter, said Philip eagerly. If the church will simply regard it as my own great desire and as one of the ways by which we may help forward our work in Milton, I am very sure we need have no fear of being put in a false light. The church does not propose this reduction. It comes from me, and in a time of peculiar emergency, both financial and social. It is a thing which has been done several times by other ministers. That may be. Still, I am positive that Calvary Church will regard it as unnecessary and will oppose it. It will not make any difference, practically, replied Philip, with a smile. I can easily dispose of a thousand dollars where it is needed by others more than me, but I would prefer that the church would actually pay out the money to them rather than myself. Mr. Winter and the other trustees looked at Philip in wonder, and with a few words of farewell, they left the parsonage. End of chapter 13 Recording by David Gore
Chapter Fourteen of the Crucifixion of Philip Strong by Charles Monroe Sheldon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Gore. Chapter Fourteen. The following week, Calvary Church held a meeting. It was one of the stormiest meetings ever held by the members. In that meeting, Mr. Winter, again, to the surprise of nearly all, advised caution and defended the minister's action up to a certain point. The result was a condition of waiting and expectancy rather than downright condemnation of the proposed action on Philip's part. It would be presenting the church in a false light to picture it as entirely opposed, up to this date, to Philip's preaching and ideas of Christian living. He had built up a strong buttress of admiring and believing members in the church. This stood, with Mr. Winter's influence, as a breakwater against the tidal wave of opposition now beginning to pour in upon him. There was an element in Calvary Church conservative to a degree, and yet strong in its growing belief that Christian action and church work in the world had reached a certain crisis which would result either in the death or the life of the church in America. Philip's preaching had strengthened this feeling. His last move had startled this element, and it wished to wait for developments. The proposal of some that the minister be requested to resign was finally overruled, and it was decided not to oppose his desertion of the parsonage, while the matter of reduction of salary was voted upon in the negative. But feeling was roused to a high pitch. Many of the members declared their intention of refusing to attend services. Some said they would not pay their pledges any longer. A prevailing minority, however, ruled in favor of Philip, and the action of the meeting was formally sent him by the clerk. Meanwhile, Philip moved out of the parsonage into his new quarters. The daily paper, which had given a sensational account of his sermon, laying most stress upon his voluntary proposition referring to his salary, now came out with a column and a half devoted to his carrying out of his determination to abandon the parsonage and get nearer the people in the tenements. The article was widely copied and variously commented upon. In Milton, his action was condemned by many, defended by some. Very few seemed to understand his exact motive. The majority took it as an eccentric move and expressed regret in one form or another that a man of such marked intellectual power as Mr. Strong seemed to possess lacked balance and good judgment. Some called him a crank. The people in the tenement district were too much absorbed in their sufferings and selfishness to show any demonstration. It remained to be seen whether they would be any better touched by him in his new home. So matters stood when the first Sunday of a new month came, and Mr. Strong again stood before his church with his Christ message. It had been a wearing month to him. Gradually there had been growing upon him a sense of almost isolation in his pulpit work. He wondered if he had interpreted Christ aright. He probed deeper and deeper into the springs of action that moved the historical Jesus, and again and again put that resplendently calm, majestic, suffering personality into his own pulpit in Milton, and then stood off, as it were, to watch what he would, in all human probability, say. He reviewed all his own sayings on those first Sundays, and tried to tax himself with utmost severity for any denial of his master or any false presentation of his spirit. And as he went over the ground, he was almost overwhelmed to think how little had been really accomplished. 
This time he came before the church with the experience of nearly three weeks hand-to-hand -hand work among the people for whose sake he had moved out of the parsonage. As usual, an immense congregation thronged the church. "'The question has come to me lately in different forms,' began Philip, "'as to what is church work.' I am aware that my attitude on the question is not shared by many of the members of this church and other churches. Nevertheless, I stand here today as I have stood on these Sundays to declare to you what in deepest humility would seem to me to be the attitude of Christ in the matter before us. What is a church? It is a body of disciples professing to acknowledge Christ as master. What does he want such a body to do? Whatever will most effectively make God's kingdom come on earth and his will be done as in heaven. What is the most necessary work of this church in Milton? It is to go out and seek and save the lost. It is to take up its cross and follow the Master. And as I see him today, he beckons this church to follow him into the tenements and slums of this town and be Christ's to those who do not know him. As I see him, he stands beckoning with pierced palms in the direction of suffering and disease and ignorance and vice and paganism, saying, here is where the work of Calvary Church lies. I do not believe the work of this church consists in having so many meetings and socials and pleasant gatherings and delightful occasions among its own members. But the real work of this church consists in getting out of its own little circle in which it has been so many years moving and going in a way most effective to the world's wounded to bind up the hurt and be a savior to the lost. If we do not understand this to be the true meaning of church work, then I believe we miss its whole meaning. Church work in Milton today does not consist in doing simply what your fathers did before you. It means helping to make a cleaner town, the purification of our municipal life, the actual planning and accomplishment of means to relieve physical distress, a thorough understanding of the problem of labor and capital. In brief, church work today in this town is whatever is most needed to be done to prove to this town that we are what we profess ourselves to be disciples of jesus christ that is the reason i give more time to the tenement district problem than to calling on families that are well and in possession of great comforts and privileges that is the reason I call on this church to do Christ's work in his name and give itself to save that part of our town. This is but the briefest of the sketches of Philip's sermon. It was a part of himself, his experience, his heart belief. He poured it out on the vast audience with little saving of his vitality. And that Sunday he went home at night exhausted, with a feeling of weariness partly due to his work during the week among the people. The calls upon his time and strength had been incessant, and he did not know where or when to stop. It was three weeks after this sermon on church work that Philip was again surprised by his strange visitor of a month before. He had been out making some visits in company with his wife. When they came back to the house, there sat the brother man on the doorstep. At sight of him, Philip felt that same thrill of expectancy which had passed over him at his former appearance. The old man stood up and took off his hat. 
he looked very tired and sorrowful. But there breathed from his entire bearing the element of a perfect peace. "'Brother man,' said Philip, cheerily, "'come in and rest yourself. "'Can you keep me overnight?' "'The question was put wistfully. "'Philip was struck by the difference "'between this almost shrinking request "'and the self-invitation of a month before. "'Yes, indeed. "'We have one spare room for you. "'You are welcome. Come in.' So they went in, and after tea the two sat down together while Mrs. Strong was busy in the kitchen. A part of this conversation was afterward related by the minister to his wife. A part of it, he afterward said, was unreportable. The manner of tone, the inflection, the gesture of his remarkable guest no man could reproduce. "'You have moved since I saw you last.' said the visitor. "'Yes,' replied Philip. "'You did not expect me to act on your advice so soon?' "'My advice?' The question came in a hesitating tone. "'Did I advise you to move?' "'Ah, oh, yes, I remember.' A light like supremest reason flashed over the man's face and then died out. "'Yes, yes. You are beginning to live on your simpler basis. You are doing as you preach. That must feel good.' "'Yes,' replied Philip. "'It does feel good. Do you think, brother man, that this will help to solve the problem?' "'What problem?' "'Why, the problem of the church and the people.' winning them, saving them. Are your church members moving out of their elegant houses and coming down here to live? The old man asked the question in utmost simplicity. No, I did not ask them. You ought to. What? Do you believe my people ought literally to leave their possessions and live among the people? Philip could not help asking the question, and all the time he was conscious of a strange absurdity mingled with an unaccountable respect for his visitor and his opinion. Yes, came the reply, with a calmness of light. Christ would demand it if he were pastor of Calvary Church in this age. The church members... The Christians in this century must renounce all they have, or they cannot be his disciples. Philip sat profoundly silent. The words spoken so quietly by this creature tossed upon his own soul like a vessel in a tempest. He dared not say anything for a moment. The brother man looked over and said at last, what have you been preaching about since you came here? A great many things. What are some of the things you have preached about? Well, Philip clasped his hands over his knees. I have preached about the right and wrong uses of property, the evil of the saloon, the Sunday as a day of rest and worship, the necessity of moving our church building down into this neighborhood, the need of living on a simpler basis, and lastly, the true work of a church in these days. Has your church done what you have wished? <sighs> no, replied Philip with a sigh. Will it do what you preach ought to be done? I do not know. Why don't you resign? The question came with a perfect simplicity, but it smote Philip almost like a blow. It was spoken with calmness that hardly rose above a whisper, but it seemed to the listener almost like a shout. The thought of giving up his work simply because his church had not yet done what he wished 
or because some of his people did not like him, was the last thing a man of his nature would do. He looked again at the man and said, Would you resign if you were in my place? No. It was so quietly spoken that Philip almost doubted if his visitor had replied. Then he said, What has been done with the parsonage? It is empty. The church is waiting to rent it to someone who expects to move to Milton soon. Are you sorry you came here? No, I am happy in my work. Do you have enough to eat and wear? Yes, indeed. The thousand dollars which the church refused to take off my salary goes to help where most needed. The rest is more than enough for us. Does your wife think so? The question from anyone else had been impertinent. From this man it was not. Let us call her in and ask her, replied Philip, with a smile. Sarah, the brother man wants to know if you have enough to live on. Sarah came in and sat down. It was dark. The year was turning into the softer months of spring, and all the outdoor world had been a benediction that evening if the sorrow and poverty and sin of the tenement districts so near had not pervaded the very walls and atmosphere of the entire place. The minister's wife answered bravely, Yes, we have food and clothing and life's necessities. But, oh, Philip, this life is wearing you out. Yes, brother man, she continued, while a tear rolled over her cheek. The minister is giving his life blood for these people, and they do not care. It is a vain sacrifice. She had spoken as frankly as if the old man had been her father. There was a something in him which called out such confidence. Mr. Strong soothed his wife, clasping her to him tenderly. There, Sarah, you are nervous and tired. I am a little discouraged, but strong and hearty for the work. Brother man, you must not think that we regret your advice. We have been blessed by following it. And then their remarkable guest stretched out his arms through the gathering gloom in the room and seemed to bless them. Later in the evening he again called for a Bible and offered a prayer of wondrous sweetness. He was shown to his plainly furnished room. He looked around and smiled. This is like my old home, he said, a palace where the poor die of hunger. Philip started at the odd remark, then recollected that the old man had once been wealthy, and sometimes in his half-dazed condition Philip thought probable he confounded the humblest surroundings with his once luxurious home. He lingered a moment, and the man said, as if speaking to himself, "'If they do not renounce all they have, they cannot be my disciples.' "'Good night, brother man,' cried Philip as he went out. "'Good night, Christ's man,' replied his guest. And Philip went to his rest that night, great questions throbbing in him, and the demands of the master more distinctly brought to his attention than ever. Again, as before when he rose in the morning, he found that his visitor was gone. His eccentric movements accounted his sudden disappearances, but they were disappointed. They wanted to see their guest again and question him about his history. They promised themselves he would do so next time. The following Sunday Philip preached one of those sermons which come to a man once or twice in a whole ministry. It was the last Sunday of the month and not a special occasion. 
but there had surged into his thought the meaning of the christian life with such uncontrollable power that his sermon reached hearts never before touched he remained at the close of the service to talk with several young men who seemed moved as never before after they had gone away he went into his own room back of the platform to get something he had left there and to his surprise found the church sexton kneeling down by one of the chairs as the minister came in the man rose and turned toward him mr strong i want to be a christian i want to join the church and lead a different life philip clasped his hand while tears rolled over the man's face he stayed and talked with him and prayed with him and when he finally went home the minister was convinced that it was as strong and true a conversation as he had ever seen he at once related the story to his wife who had gone on before to get dinner why philip she exclaimed when he said the sexton wanted to be baptized and unite with the church at the next communion cavalry church will never allow him to unite with us why not asked philip in amazement because he is a negro replied his wife philip stood a moment in silence with his hat in his hand looking at his wife as she spoke End of chapter 14. Recording by David Gore. Chapter 15 of The Crucifixion of Philip Strong by Charles Monroe Sheldon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Gore. Chapter 15. Well, said Philip slowly, as he seemed to grasp the meaning of his wife's words. To tell the truth, I never thought of that. He sat down and looked troubled. Do you think, Sarah, that because he is a Negro, the church will refuse to receive him to membership? It would not be Christian to refuse him. There are other things that are Christian which the Church of Christ on earth does not do, Philip replied his wife almost bitterly but whatever else calvary church may do or not do i am very certain it will never consent to admit to membership a black man but there are so few negroes in milton that they have no church i cannot counsel him to unite with his own people calvary church must admit him Philip spoke with the quiet determination which always marked his convictions when they were settled. But suppose the committee refuses to report his name favorably to the church, what then? Mrs. Strong spoke with a gleam of hope in her heart that Philip would be roused to indignation that he would resign and leave Milton. Philip did not reply at once. He was having an inward struggle with his sensitiveness and his interpretation of his Christ. At last he said, I don't know, Sarah. I shall do what I think he would. What I shall do afterward will also depend on what Christ would do. I cannot decide it yet. I have great faith in the church on earth. And yet what has it done for you so far, Philip? The businessmen still own and rent the saloons and gambling houses. The money spent by the church is all out of proportion to its wealth. Here you give away half your salary to build up the kingdom of God, and more than a dozen men in Calvary who are worth fifty and a hundred thousand dollars give less than a hundredth part of their income to Christian work in connection with the church. It makes my blood boil, Philip, to see how you are throwing your life away in these miserable tenements, and wasting your appeals on a church that plainly does not intend to do, does not want to do, as Christ would have it. And I don't believe it ever will. I'm not so sure of that, Sarah, replied Philip cheerfully. I believe I shall win them yet. 
The only thing that sometimes troubles me is, am I doing just as Christ would do? Am I saying what he would say in this age of the world? There is one thing of which I am certain. I am trying to do just as I believe he would. The mistakes I make are those which spring from my failure to interpret his action right. And yet I do feel deep in me that if he was pastor of this church today, he would do most of the things I have done. He would preach most of the truths I have proclaimed. Don't you think so, Sarah? I don't know, Philip. Yes, I think in most things you have made an honest attempt to interpret him. And in the matter of the sexton, Sarah, wouldn't Christ tell Calvary Church that it should admit him to its membership? Would he make any distinction of persons? If the man is a Christian, thoroughly converted, and wants to be baptized and unite with Christ's body on earth, would Christ, as pastor, refuse him admission? There is a great deal of race prejudice among the people. If you press the matter, Philip, I feel sure it will meet with great opposition. That is not the question with me. Would Christ tell Calvary Church that the man ought to be admitted? That is the question. I believe he would, added Philip, with his sudden grasp of practical action. And Mrs. Strong knew that settled it with her husband. It was the custom in Calvary Church for the church committee on new names for membership to meet at the minister's house on the Monday evening preceding the preparatory service. At that service, all names presented by the committee were formally acted upon by the church. The committee's action was generally considered final, and the voting was in accordance with the committee's report. So when the committee came in that evening following the Sunday that had witnessed the conversion of the sexton, Philip had ready a list of names, including several young men. It was a very precious list to him. It seemed almost for the first time since he came to Milton as if the growing opposition to him was about to be checked and finally submerged beneath a power of the Holy Spirit which it was Philip's daily prayer might come and do the work which he alone could not do. That was one reason he had borne the feeling against himself so calmly. Philip read the list over to the committee, saying something briefly about nearly all the applicants for membership, and expressing his joy that young men especially were coming into the church family. When he reached the sexton's name, he related, simply, the scene with him after the morning service. There was an awkward pause then. The committee was plainly astonished. Finally, one said, Brother Strong, I am afraid the church will object to receiving the sexton. What is his name? Henry Rowland. "'Why, he has been sexton of Calvary Church for ten years,' said another, an older member of the committee, Deacon Stearns by name. "'He has been an honest, capable man. I never heard any complaint of him. He has always minded his own business. However, I don't know how the church will take it to consider him as an applicant for membership.' "'Why, brethren,' "'How can it take it in any except the Christian way?' said Philip, eagerly. "'Here is a man who gives evidence of being born again. "'He cannot be present tonight when the other applicants come in later, "'owing to work he must do, "'but I can say for him that he gave all evidence "'of a most sincere and thorough conversion. "'He wishes to be baptized. "'He wants to unite with the church.' He is of more than average intelligence. He is not a person to thrust himself into places where people do not wish him, a temperate, industrious, modest, quiet workman, a Christian believer asking us to receive him at the communion table of our Lord. There is no church for his own people here. 
on what possible pretext can the church refuse to admit him? You do not know some of the members of Calvary Church, Mr. Strong, if you ask such a question. There is a very strong prejudice against the Negro in many families. This prejudice is especially strong just at this time, owing to several acts of depredation committed by the Negroes living down near the railroad tracks. I don't believe it would be wise to present this name just now. Deacon Stearns appeared to speak for the committee, all of whom murmured assent in one form or another. And yet, said Philip, roused to a sudden heat of indignation, and yet what is Calvary Church doing to help make those men down by the railroad tracks any better? Are we concerned about them at all, except when our coal or wood or clothing are stolen, or someone is held up down there? And when one of them knocks at the door of the church, can we calmly and coldly shut it in his face, simply because God made it a different color from ours? Philip stopped and then finished by saying very quietly, Brethren, do you think Christ would receive this man into the church? There was no reply for a moment. Then Deacon Stearns answered, Brother Strong, we have to deal with humanity as it is. You cannot make people all over. This prejudice exists, and sometimes we may have to respect it in order to avoid greater trouble. I know families in the church who will certainly withdraw if the sexton is voted in as a member. And still, said the old deacon with a sigh, I believe Christ would receive him into his church. Before much more could be said, the different applicants came, and as the custom was, after a brief talk with them about their purpose in uniting with the church and their discipleship, they withdrew and the committee formally acted on the names for presentation to the church. The name of Henry Rowland, the sexton, was finally reported unfavorably, three of the committee voting against it, Deacon Stearns at last voting with the minister to present the sexton's name with the others. Now, brethren, said Philip with a sad smile as they rose to go, you know I have always been very frank in all our relations together, and I am going to present the sexton's name to the church Thursday night and let the church vote on it in spite of the action here tonight. You know we only have recommending power. The church is the final authority, and it may accept or reject any names we present. I cannot rest satisfied until we know the verdict of the church in the matter. Brother Strong, said one of the committee, who had been opposed to the sexton, you are right as to the extent of our authority. But there is no question in my mind as to the outcome of the matter. It is a question of expediency. I do not have any feeling against the sexton, but I think it would be very unwise to receive him into membership, and I do not believe the church will receive him. If you present the name, you do so on your own responsibility. With mine, said Deacon Stearns. He was the last to shake hands with the minister, and his warm, strong grasp gave Philip a sense of fellowship that thrilled him with a sense of courage and companionship very much needed. He at once went up to his study after the committee was gone. Mrs. Strong, coming up to see him later, found him, as she often did now, on his knees in prayer. Ah, thou follower of Jesus in this century, what but thy prayer shall strengthen thy soul in the strange days to come? Thursday evening was stormy. A heavy rain had set in before dark, and a high wind blew great sheets of water through the streets and rattled loose boards and shingles about the tenements. 
Philip would not let his wife go out. It was too stormy. So he went his way alone, somewhat sorrowful at heart, as he contemplated the prospect of a small attendance on what he had planned should be an important occasion. However, some of the best members of the church were out. The very ones that were in sympathy with Philip and his methods were in the majority of those present, and that led to an unexpected result when the names of the applicants for membership came before the church for action. Philip read the list approved by the committee, and then very simply but powerfully told the sexton's story and the refusal of the committee to recommend him for membership. Now I do not see how we can shut this disciple of Jesus out of his church, concluded Philip, and I wish to present him to this church for its action. He is a Christian. He needs our help and our fellowship, and as Christian believers, as disciples of the man of all the race, as those who believe that there is to be no distinction of souls hereafter that shall separate them by prejudice, I hope you will vote to receive this brother in Christ to our membership. The voting on new members was done by ballot. When the ballots were all in and counted, it was announced that all whose names were presented were unanimously elected except that of the sexton. There were twelve votes against him, but twenty-six for him, and Philip declared that, according to the constitution of the church, he was duly elected. The meeting then went on in the usual manner characteristic of preparatory service. The sexton had been present in the back part of the room, and at the close of the meeting, after all the rest had gone, he and Philip had a long talk together. When Philip reached home, he and Sarah had another long talk on the same subject. What that was we cannot tell until we come to record the events of the Communion Sunday, a day that stood out in Philip's memory like one of the bleeding palms of his master, pierced with sorrow but eloquent with sacrifice. End of chapter 15 Recording by David Gore Chapter 16 of The Crucifixion of Philip Strong by Charles Monroe Sheldon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by David Gore. Chapter 16. The day was beautiful and the church as usual crowded to the doors. There was a feeling of hardly concealed excitement on the part of Calvary Church. The action of Thursday night had been sharply criticized. Very many thought Philip had gone beyond his right in bringing such an important subject before so small a meeting of the members, and the prospect of the approaching baptism and communion of the sexton had drawn in a crowd of people who ordinarily stayed away from that service. Philip generally had no preaching on Communion Sunday. This morning he remained on the platform after the opening exercises, and, in a stillness which was almost painful in its intensity, he began to speak in a low but clear and impressive voice. Fellow disciples of the Church of Christ on earth, we meet to celebrate the memory of that greatest of all beings who, on the eve of his own greatest agony, prayed that his disciples might all be one. In that prayer he said nothing about color, or race, or difference of speech, or social surroundings. His prayer was that his disciples might all be one, one in their aims, in their purposes, their sympathy, their faith, their hope, their love. An event has happened in this church very recently which makes it necessary for me to say these words. The Holy Spirit came into this room last Sunday 
and touched the hearts of several young men who gave themselves then and there to the lord jesus christ among the men was one of another race from the anglo-saxon he was a black man his heart was melted by the same love his mind illuminated by the same truth he desired to make confession of his belief be baptized according to the commands of jesus and unite with this church as an humble disciple of the lowly nazarene his name was presented with the rest at the regular committee meeting last monday and that committee by a vote of three to two refused to present his name with recommendations for membership on my own responsibility at the preparatory service thursday night i asked the church to act upon this disciple's name there was a legal quorum of the church present by a vote of twenty-six to twelve the applicant for membership was received according to the rules of this church but after that meeting the man came to me and said that he was unwilling to unite with the church knowing that some objected to his membership it was a natural feeling for him to have we had a long talk over the matter since then i have learned that if a larger representation of members had been present at the preparatory meeting there is a possibility that the number voting against receiving the applicant would have been much larger than those who voted for him under all these circumstances i have deemed it my duty to say what i have thus far said and to ask the church to take the action i now propose we are met here this morning in full membership here is a soul just led out of the darkness by the spirit of truth he is one known to many of you as an honest worthy man for many years faithful in the discharge of his duties in this house there is no christian reason why he should be denied fellowship around this table i wish therefore to ask the members of the church to vote again on the acceptance or rejection of henry Rowland, disciple of jesus who has asked for permission to this body of christ in his name will all those in favor of thus receiving our brother into the great family of faith signify it by raising the right hand for a moment not a person in the church stirred every one seemed smitten into astonished inaction by the sudden proposal of the minister then hands began to go up philip counted them his heart beating with anguish as he foresaw the coming result he waited a minute it seemed to many like several minutes and then said all those opposed to the admission of the applicant signify it by the same sign again there was the same significant reluctant pause then half a dozen hands went up in front of the church instantly from almost every part of the house hands went up in numbers that almost doubled those who had voted in favor of admission from the gallery on the sides where several of philip's workmen friends sat a hiss arose it was slight but heard by the entire congregation philip glanced up there and it instantly ceased without another word he stepped down from the platform and began to read the list of those who had been received into church membership he had almost reached the end of it when a person whose name was called last rose from his seat near the front where all the newly received members were in the habit of sitting together and turning partly around so as to face the congregation and still address philip he said mr strong i do not feel as if after what has taken place here this morning that i could unite with this church 
This man, who has been excluded from church membership, is the son of a woman born into slavery on the estate of one of my relatives. That slave woman once nursed her master through a terrible illness and saved his life. This man, her son, was then a little child, but in the strange changes that have gone on since the war, the son of the old master has been reduced to poverty and obliged to work for a living. He is now in this town. He is this very day lying upon a sick bed in the tenement district, and this black man has for several weeks out of his small earnings helped the son of his mother's master and cared for him through his illness with all the devotion of a friend. I have only lately learned these facts, but knowing them as I do, and believing that he is as worthy to sit about this table as any Christian here, I cannot reconcile the rejection with my own purpose to unite here. I therefore desire to withdraw my application for membership here. Mr. Strong, I desire to be baptized and partake of the communion as a disciple of Christ, simply, not as a member of Calvary Church. Can I do so? Philip replied in a choking voice, You can. The man sat down. It was not the place for any demonstration, but again from the gallery came a slight but distinct note of applause. As before, it instantly subsided as Philip looked up. For a moment, every one held his breath and waited for the minister's action. Philip's face was pale and stern. What his sensitive nature suffered in that moment no one ever knew, not even his wife, who almost started from her seat, fearing that he was about to faint. For a moment there was a hesitation about Philip's manner so unusual with him that some thought he was going to leave the church. But he quickly called on his will to assert its power, and taking up the regular communion service, he calmly took charge of it as if nothing out of the way had occurred. He did not even allude to the morning's incident in his prayers. Whatever else the people might think of Philip, they certainly could find no fault with his self-possession. His conduct of the service on that memorable Sunday was admirable. When it was over, he was surrounded by different ones who had taken part either for or against the sexton. There was much said about the matter. But all the arguments and excuses and comments on the affair could not remove the heartache from Philip he could not reconcile the action of the church with the spirit of the church's master, Jesus. And when he finally reached home and calmly reviewed the events of the morning, he was more and more grieved for the church and for his master. It seemed to him that a great mistake had been made, and that Calvary Church had disgraced the name of Christianity. As he had been in the habit of doing since he moved into the neighborhood of the tenements, Philip went out in the afternoon to visit the sick and the sorrowful. The shutting down of the mills had resulted in an immense amount of suffering and trouble. As spring came on, some few of the mills had opened, and men had found work in them at a reduction of wages. The entire history of the enforced idleness of thousands of men in Milton during that eventful winter would make a large volume of thrilling narrative. Philip's story but touches on this other. He had grown rapidly familiar with the different phases of life which loafed and idled and drank itself away during that period of inaction. Hundreds of men had drifted away to other places in search of work. Almost as many more had taken to the road to swell the ever-increasing number of professional tramps, and in time to develop into petty thieves and criminals. But those who remained had a desperate struggle with poverty. 
Philip grew sick at heart as he went among the people and saw the complete helplessness, the utter estrangement of sympathy and community of feeling between the church people and these representatives of the physical labor of the world. Every time he went out to do his visiting, this feeling deepened in him. This Sunday afternoon in particular, it seemed to him as if the depression and discouragement of the tenement district weighed on him like a great burden, bearing him down to the earth with sorrow and heartache. He had been in the habit of going out to Communion Sunday with the emblems of Christ to observe the rite by the bedsides of the aged or ill, or those who could not get out to church. He carried with him this time a basket containing a part of the Communion service. After going to the homes of one or two invalid church members, he thought of the person who had been mentioned by the man in the morning as living in the tenement district and in critical condition. He had secured his address, and after a little inquiry, he soon found himself in a part of the tenements near to him. He climbed up three flights of stairs and knocked at the door. It was opened by the sexton. He greeted Philip with glad surprise the minister smiled sadly so my brother it is true you are serving your master here my heart is grieved at the action of the church this morning don't say anything mr strong you did all you could but you are just in time to see him the sexton pointed into a small back room he is going fast i didn't suppose he was so near I would have asked you to come, but I didn't think he was failing so. Philip followed the sexton into the room. The son of the old slave master was sinking rapidly. He was conscious, however, and at Philip's quiet questioning concerning his peace with God, a smile passed over his face, and he moved his lips. Philip understood him. A sudden thought occurred to Philip. He opened the basket, took out the bread and wine, set them on the small table, and said, Disciple of Jesus, would you like to partake of the blessed communion once more before you see the King in his glory? The gleam of satisfaction in the man's eyes told Philip enough. The sexton said in a low voice, he belonged to the Southern Episcopal Church in Virginia. Something in the wistful look of the sexton gave Philip an inspiration for what followed. Brother, he said, turning to the sexton, what is to hinder your baptism and partaking of the communion? Yes, this is Christ's church, wherever his true disciples are. Then the sexton brought a basin of water, and as he kneeled down by the side of the bed, Philip baptized him with the words, I baptize thee, Henry, my brother, disciple of Jesus, into the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen, murmured the man on the bed. Then Philip, still standing as he was, bowed his head, saying, Blessed Lord Jesus, accept these children of thine. Bless this new disciple, and unite our hearts in love for thee and thy kingdom, as we remember thee now in this service. He took the bread and said, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. In the name of the Master who said these words, eat, remembering his love for us. The dying man could not lift his hand to take the bread from the plate. Philip gently placed a crumb between his lips. The sexton, still kneeling, partook, and bowing his head between his hands, sobbed. Philip poured out the wine and said, in the name of the Lord Jesus, this cup is the New Testament in his blood, shed for all mankind for the remission of sins. 
he carried the cup to the lips of the man and then gave to the sexton the smile on the dying man's face died the gray shadow of the last enemy was projected onto the room from the setting sun of death's approaching twilight the son of the old slave master was going to meet the mother of the man who was born into the darkness of slavery but born again into the light of god perhaps perhaps he thought who knows but the first news he would bring to her would be the news of that communion. Certain it is that his hand moved vaguely over the blanket. It slipped over the edge of the bed and fell upon the bowed head of the sexton and remained there as if in benediction. And so the shadow deepened, and at last it was like unto nothing else known to the sons of men on earth and the spirit leaped out of its clay tenement with the breath of the communion wine still on the lips of the frail perishable body philip reverently raised the arm and laid it on the bed the sexton rose and while tears rolled over his face he gazed long into the countenance of the son of his old master no division of race now no faults and selfish prejudice here come let the neighbors of the dead come in to do the last sad offices to the casket for the soul of this disciple is in the mansions of glory and it shall hunger no more neither thirst any more neither shall the darkness of death ever again smite it for it shall live for ever in the light of that Lamb of God who gave himself for the remission of sins and the life everlasting. Philip did what he could on such an occasion. It was not an unusual event altogether. He had prayed by many a poor creature in the clutch of the last enemy, and he was familiar with his face in the tenements but this particular scene had a meaning and left an impression different from any he had known before when finally he was at liberty to go home for a little rest before the evening service he found himself more than usually tired and sorrowful mrs strong noticed it as he came in she made him lie down and urged him to give up his evening service no no sarah I can't do that. I am prepared. I must preach. I'll get a nap, and then I'll feel better, he said. Mrs. Strong shook her head, but Philip was determined. He slept a little, ate a little lunch, and when the time of service came, he went up to the church again. As his habit was just before the hour of beginning, he went into the little room at the side of the platform to pray by himself. When he came out and began the service, no one could have told from his manner that he was suffering physically. Even Mrs. Strong, who was watching him anxiously, felt relieved to see how quiet and composed he was. He had commenced his sermon and had been preaching with great eloquence for ten minutes when he felt a strange dizziness and a pain in his side that made him catch his breath and clutch the side of the pulpit to keep from falling. It passed away, and he went on. It was only a slight hesitation, and no one remarked anything out of the way. For five minutes he spoke with increasing power and feeling. The church was filled. It was very quiet. Suddenly, without any warning, he threw up his arms, uttered a cry of half-suppressed agony, and then fell over backward. A thrill of excitement ran through the audience. For a moment no one moved. Then everyone rose. The men in the front pews rushed up to the platform. Mrs. Strong was already there. Philip's head was raised. Philip's old friend, the surgeon, was in the crowd, and he at once examined him. He was not dead, and the doctor at once directed the proper movement for his removal from the church. As he was being carried out into the air, he revived and was able to speak. 
take me home he whispered to his wife who hung over him in a terror as great as her love for him at that moment a carriage was called and he was taken home the doctor remained until philip was fully conscious it was very warm and i was very tired and i fainted eh doctor first time i ever did such a thing in my life i am ashamed i spoiled the service philip uttered this slowly and feebly when at last he had recovered enough to know where he was the doctor looked at him suspiciously you never fainted before eh well if i were you i would take care not to faint again take good care of him mrs strong he needs rest milton could spare a dozen bad men like me better than one like the domine doctor cried mrs strong in sudden fear what is the matter is this serious not at all but men like your husband are in need of watching take good care of him good care of him doctor he will not mind me i wanted him to stay at home to-night but he wouldn't then put a chain and padlock on him and hold him in growled the surgeon he prescribed a medicine and went away assuring mrs strong that philip would feel much better in the morning the surgeon's prediction came true philip found himself weak the next day but able to get about in reply to numerous calls of inquiry for the minister mrs strong was able to report that he was much better about eleven o'clock when the postman called philip was in his study lying on his lounge his wife brought up two letters one of them was from his old chum he read that first he then laid it down and opened the other at that moment mrs strong was called downstairs by a ring at the door when she had answered it she came upstairs again as she came into the room she was surprised at the queer look on philip's face without a word he handed her the letter he had just opened and with the same look watched her face as she read it end of chapter 16 recording by david gore